testing no testing okay there we go all right so we're starting uh, looking at an end state this is the end of the recent brandy station battle where um predict predictably everything well, actually very little that went exactly as i planned and very little that usually goes exactly as the umpires plan but i think it went well and everyone had a lot of fun and there are much there I, my ai got much much too long on this whole thing i think it got 40 pages long um, but yes, this is the end state of, hang on, a shattered right wing of the federal right wing retreating or trying to retreat and getting cut off by a death or glory lunge down the Rappahannock, but the left wing was able to get away. Now, looking at the situation here, you'll see the left wing there really isn't that much over here. There's a brigade, there's some guns, there's some wagons, but the left looks wide open behind Hansborough Mountain, even though there's quite a lot of rebels here. And that's, you know, yes, if, if the rebels had been aware of it and had attacked across it, they could have probably collapsed the other flank. But this isn't a bug. This isn't a flaw. This isn't something that is a mistake. This is the system working as intended because fog of war and enough movement along the ridge the rule player was never aware of how open it was because of the maneuvers of the federals and so that in turn yeah that they managed to keep a presence there they kept the flank open and that meant that a good half of this army escaped intact which will come up in a future Scenario. There, there will be a scenario two of this. So, Kriegspiel. Literally, war game. Now, there are two schools of thought, and they're both right and they're both wrong. Firstly, Kriegspiel is not a game, as Marshall, who is right here, likes to say. Uh, I think he's right because it, it is a learning exercise. It was originally designed, originally designed to allow Prussian ability to play with, play at war. And then it became a useful training tool. Um, and it still is a useful training tool. There's whether you're wargaming market manipulation, whether you're wargaming crisis response, whether you're wargaming... Uh, we saw an article recently about uh, the US wargaming a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And apparently in 2020, they wargamed it. And in the wargame, the US went down hard. And the... the News media, who did, mainstream media who didn't entirely get it, were going, oh no, oh no, that means we, in any conflict we'd lose. But the US was actually delighted with this result, or at least the military was delighted with the result, because you learn so much more from defeat than from victory. And so that allowed them to look at, okay, what capabilities do we need? What capabilities did we miss? What do we need to develop and do better at? And that's why Kriegsmill or Wargaming. Wargaming in its realist sense is a valuable tool. Not for predicting exactly how things will go, because the exact order of and chain of events and decisions will rarely be the same. But just to exercise how things could go, a plausible flow of events. Uh, and why else is it not a game? Because you are unlike in a strategy game, a strategy game where anything that could happen you, you have to have the control to exercise your strategies in all situations in most strategy games. You could, like in Crusader Kings, for example, you could go ahead and set up a Norse kingdom in Egypt if you really wanted to. It would take some doing, but you can do that. This, that is not true in Kriegspiel. In Kriegspiel, there is a limited situation. You have a limited control of the circumstances around you. Your cavalry probably won't teleport across the field. It probably will have to fight at some point, or it can march around and avoid people. And there is no catch-up mechanic. If things start going badly against you, that doesn't mean you've lost, but it means you have a more challenging situation to deal with, whereas most games, including many war games, 
quite consciously gamify in the other direction, and they want to keep everyone in the game, and that makes sense. But it does also make it less realistic, less brutal, less challenging. Um, because it's... Yeah, it, it's less... There's no catch-up mechanic. And that's another reason why I feel it's not entirely a game. Now, why it also is a game, so this is why Marshall was wrong. It's played by most of us for enjoyment rather than as a training exercise, myself included. Uh, and I would regard it as something of a grog game, a grognard game. Um, from like, There's a whole class of them, which is a game that's played because some of the parts are sometimes painfully realistic. Um, and it takes a certain masochistic frame of mind to see the enjoyment in making it harder for yourself because it's more realistic and so it's a better experience all around. But yeah, I think it, it is enjoyable in its form and it's enjoyable to play these out and to, yeah. Uh, it's a free-form role. I see it as a free-form role-playing game. You play the role of a commander. Uh, and that's the best way to approach this in my mind. It's certainly what anyone will know who's seen my career messages to them. You have the fo you have fog of war. You you know what your commander knows, and not you don't know what they don't know. And you see what they see, and with that frame of reference and with that knowledge, you give the orders you would give. Uh, there are rules. That's the, the other key thing here. There are rules that guide this. They are not always one hundred percent binding. You have umpires who, with their expertise and their knowledge of the period, which isn't the same as if we were all 19th century generals and the people who are who are deciding the outcomes have physically fought in all these conflicts. There are very few of us who have that kind of experience. Um, I would say none, unless we're playing in a fairly modern scenario. But many of us have done a lot of reading. Many of us have done a lot of gaming and a lot of creature pill ourselves. So we have our informed opinions, and that's partly why I think it's a good thing that we're seeing more and more and more variations on core on a core rule set or new inventions of core rules, because different things, as Marshall was saying beforehand, different aspects that different umpires feel are important to look at or important to represent are getting highlighted in our various rule sets. So this was the last major American Civil War scenario I ran. And this is the test scenario I set up for today. This is purely, this is not the open Saturday scenario, by the way. You're not seeing anything you shouldn't see. Um, this is literally one brigade aside. This is what I was running a few times just to test some skirmish mechanics I wanted to see and this is also the other thing that we're doing today that'll be a bit different is we're potentially playing down to the regimental level so we're not seeing block one block two block three of this brigade we're seeing these blocks are the first second the, the, the first brigade of the third fifth fourth and second Grenzers on one side on the other side we're seeing the first brigade of the 19th lean line, the 2nd Brigade of the 99th line, we're seeing the 2nd North um, Valley Volunteers, 2nd Marne Volunteers, or Northern Volunteers, sorry, 3rd Mirth Volunteers, and the 2nd Upper Vienne Volunteers. So this is, we've literally extracted a brigade each from historical formations, and we've got them here to test out some skirmish mechanics. And that's fine, and we will do that shortly. Um, welcome, Dustin. Welcome back. Uh, so, in terms of the flow of play, uh, in a... Sorry, let me finish that point. The the change between the two, I think for a, if I was running an American Civil War game tomorrow, I would probably still use the same pieces that I have, that I did there, uh, because that's my latest working American Civil War system. This is the system I'm hoping to use for the upcoming Avalonia campaign, uh, which is in the Red vs. Blue series. 
and also just because in Avalonia, which is our new world setting, armies are going to be much smaller. So I need a system that can support combat between a couple of brigades on one side, a couple of brigades on the other. Currently, our most common systems assume that every player will be a division commander or even a corps commander. The, like the, the lowest level command could be division or corps, and so the pieces they move will be brigades. If we're in a situation where you might have three players on the side, and but they only really have two brigades there, okay, well that's a division commander and two brigade, two brigadiers with maybe a few bolt-on elements to fit the divisional level, like artillery or supply. So I'm using Damon's excellent new pieces for this, and ideally for that. Welcome, Evergreen. So in terms of the flow of play, how we see these happen normally, when people first get recruited, there'll be the initial planning phase when, as we get into the game, and we'll sort people out as they're in this team, they're at that team. That's also the stage where we discuss what roles people are taking, and that's also where they will share the briefings and they'll be able to just work, look at the map for the first time together, discuss what they're seeing, work out how they, they want to approach it, and yeah, establish the chain of command and the plan. Then we split into the various channels, where you are only in the channel where you're co-located with other commanders who you could talk with, and that's the player turn, where the assistant umpires will go around, so there'll be a lead umpire and a number of assistant umpires, usually one to two, one to three. So one umpire to, I mean, in an ideal world, one to one, but that is really needed. But So one umpire to two or three players is fine. And they will first go around each of the players giving a screenshot of what they can see. So to my mind, let's see, we don't have brig brigadier markers on this. But let's assume this central unit here, to the 22nd, the second of the 99th line, is where your brigadier marker is. You are presenting what they can see. The default in Kriegspiel, and I think it's a good default, and so one we should stick to, is that up is north in all screenshots. So just to help keep track of things, it also means all the writing is in the right direction. Unless there are terrain features obscuring your view, the default is four grid squares. Each grid square represents about 400 paces in any direction, is what they can see. So what I would represent is I would screenshot two, three, I would screenshot this area. And I would screenshot up to about there. So you'll notice that, that it's a lot shallow behind. That's not because in a 15-minute turn we wouldn't look around and see behind us. It's just because of the trees obscuring things. Uh, if there are units in this valley area, I would include the area in the screenshot, but I would drag units out of that area before I took the screenshot. That's this valley area here. If Same for this valley area here. And just because you can see it in the screenshot doesn't always mean it's 100% accurate. One thing you'll notice that I'm doing in this rule set is you notice that there are white pieces, or white or grey pieces on both sides. I'm using the piece colour to represent the uniforms. So the Austrian side in this conflict would see white and blue uniforms, which is correct because this, court, this brigade is drawn from a constitutional monarchy order battle. So there are both white uniformed French regulars and there are blue uniformed volunteers. The white, these are Austrian troops, Austrian Grenzes, so they are in white uniforms. So that's what you'd report. You, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't necessarily report, like if this is a screenshot, so you need to be at least this top and bottom, you wouldn't report there is, you see the first Grenzer, the four, fourth Grenzer, the second Grenzer, you say you see four units of white uniform troops. Maybe when you get closer, you'd be able to identify those are Grenzers, but at this range, you wouldn't. So you get the screenshot with a timestamp, in your player channel each turn from your assistant umpire or lead umpire and then they would go around and first tell, tell you what they see so they might tell you um, you see you are the French commander you see a, a line of Grenz approaching in four formations they 
So you would not see this side. You don't see these numbers. We have numbers to keep track on them, systems, but you wouldn't see that aspect. Um, you see four formations of Grenz's approaching. They are pushing out a skirmish line, which is advancing rapidly towards you. And there we go. You know these skirmishes are from the fourth Grenz. We know the, and so on and so on and so on. We can mouse over them as the umpire and see who they belong to, but as far as you, the player, know, you just see a skirmish line heading out towards you, probably see them in the screenshot as well, and you hear about the movement, you hear about the sounds. You could also hear about things that are outside your immediate screenshot field of view. You might hear, you, you see, um, you see some, uh, some yellow uniforms, and maybe you see some wagons on the road over here. Maybe you hear the sound of artillery from a few miles to your north. Maybe you see red and green uniforms on the road behind you, descending out of you behind the Bois de Bois. And this information is presented to you in a live scenario by the system umpire coming around and talking to you. We're just doing the live here. Play by post, you generally have see one umpire writing everything up. That's different. It takes longer, but it does allow more control of the experience. So having done that one pass, because you might have two or three different stops, with each person, you tell them what they see, you tell them what they hear and perceive. Ask, you ask them, is there anything else you want to know about what you can see? Do you have any questions about what you can see? And then you move on. You give them a minute or two, or two to think about that. Not lots of time, but a minute or two to think about that while you're going on to talk to the other people. And then you take another pass through and you take their orders. Now, as the umpire or assistant umpire, you would have the umpire table open, which shows where everything actually is. And so, let's say I am the umpire taking orders from Blue. I've given them that information. They are now back with them again. They're giving the order that they would like to push their skirmishes out. So I mark that on here, and like so. And I say, all right, well, I'm going to say that they're in two ranks. So you mark that on there, and then you talk to me about the... You talk to the lead umpire about the actual execution, where it can interact with anybody else. In fact, you talk to them about it anywhere. But if you're telling me, if we... I'm getting ahead of myself. You mark the, down the orders so you will remember them. So that's what we're doing here. And then once all orders are collected from all parties, so the Grenzers would give their orders as well, which in this case will be... Uh, I've got mouse open. To advance. Then you get into the umpire turn. So you you declare no more orders. Everyone's given the orders. You go in, and then we talk about the situation. And as the lead umpire in this situation, I would ask, are there any possible interactions? So if these blue troops are in march column and they're back in Fay and they're marching down the road, then I'll say, great, that's fine. They're going to move in road column down that road. They will move five squares. So go ahead and move them five squares down that road. I don't need to be involved. In this situation, there's a clear direct interaction. So these formations are pushing out some skirmishes. Let's grab these and that. And they push out to say here. And these push out to here. And at a range of 400 paces, the skirmishers will start interacting with each other. That's sort of their engagement range. It doesn't mean they're standing there at 400 paces firing volleys at each other, but they are close enough to be skirmishing with aimed fire slowly. These units will advance partway because they will maintain, they might maintain 200 paces distance behind their skirmish line, but they're not closing at the moment because they weren't ordered to. It's a general advance of the whole can get a force. So when the skirmishers are in range interact, they interact. Now let's look at this first round of skirmishing because they have time to interact as well. So we see that there's, I'm using the middle digit here to represent their experience level, which can be used for a number of things, but for now that will work fine. So these are, we've got volunteers who are trained We've got regulars who are tra trained level, and we've got some volunteers which are rawer. Against which we have 
some veteran grenzers and some trained grenzers. And you know, you'll notice I structure these in the order in the order of the formations. So if we see damage, I can use that to relate to where it's applied. So 15 minutes of skirmishing. We're looking at doubles. So in this case, only the veterans connect because they get doubles. And so the skirmishers for the second North V, they have been removed. They've been wiped out. They've been dispersed. They haven't been killed to a man, but they're no longer a functioning skirmish body. So then we come back. We t talk to players and we tell them, all right, your skirmishers have engaged. Um, there's, you're taking heavy losses from the skirmishers at the northern end of the field. You tell the Austrian player, you tell, sorry, the French player, you tell the Austrian player you're penetrating the skirmish line. They're still there. They're still skirmishing. The, the, this is a, an abstract formation. The skirmishers don't sit there purely in one body. The skirmish line will extend out the front of the whole brigade, but it does mean that we can see that it's weakening towards the left. And they might push out, they will continue to push out skirmishers. So at this stage, they can push out skirmishers from the second line to thicken this and have. So there's, yep, they push out skirmishers from the second line. That's That'll be the, that'll be what they will do. But before we get to that, the Austrians hear that the battle is going on. Like that, they're, they're confident their skirmishers are reducing the enemy skirmishers. They, if they can, they would like to try and shoot their way through all the French skirmishers and then have their skirmishers actually preying on the enemy line formations. So they're happy, happy to keep doing what they're doing. They have no particular urgency. Um, so we will go to a second round of combat. Justin, while you set that up, I have a question. Can you explain, please, why mm -hmm. we're looking for doubles in the resolution? Okay, that's a system that I'm using to represent for skirmishes. So, the skirmishes are less decisive, mm -hmm. but they are. It, it also it looking at all the historical um, battlefield accounts. There, they talk a lot about how experience really does pay dividends with skirmishes, and how skirmishes you could have skirmishes for new volunteers or raw militia, but they're mostly useless. And so I looked at the at the probabilities on these dice, and I decided both one, skirmishers are not going to deal enough manpower damage to actually deal a heavy manpower hit to a block of line. That is mm -hmm. not. But what they are going to do is they will apply disruption. And looking at the dice, the fact that the white dice have many, they have many less disruption results than the more experienced dice. Mm -hmm. That way, it's insisting on two hits. And for the record, that's two hits. That also includes a star and a hit. So I will I'll allow that as well. But uh, Sorry, yeah. if I may. Um, how do you determine the number of dice exactly? Sorry. Block of skirmishes involved. Okay. So Thank each you. unit, each regular unit, can push it, has one block of skirmishes, like the skirmish company, and that's the only amount of skirmishes they will ever have for the battle. So okay. if... Um, if so this unit has lost the skirmishers so I, I before the battle started i marked an s on every unit just to say how many skirmishers they have um which is purely an umpire notation you won't see that as the player but however so you can assume everyone has skirmishers there could be jaegers there could be voltagers there could be a Leger regiment or Leger battalion those will all have the ability to push out more skirmishers so if you read in a battle situation about um, the 4th Leger pushed out a line of skirmishers in front of the entire advancing division. We can do that. They can do that. But once you start pushing out more than a block of skirmishers, it starts to actually impact your manpower. So you could dissolve a, a block of light infantry to put out a thick skirmish line ahead of your line of battle, which is it's a decision. It's not necessarily a good or a bad one. It's just a decision. And then and... see how that goes. And different dice represent different experience levels? Yes. yes. Okay. That answers everything I have so far. Thank you. So, yeah, the more experienced skirmishers are more likely to get doubles, are more likely to get hits. That doesn't make them any more bulletproof than anybody else. Um, so in this case, we are pushing, pushing these two out here. And these out here. So we've got white, we've got yellow, we've got another... So for the, the 
using 15 minute turns, we're now looking at the second 30 minute skirmishing. I've accidentally rolled one of the skirmish, di skirmish <laughs> tokens. Um, mm. You see, skirmishing has gone. So there's one hit here that will remove this unit, one of these two units. I'm going to say this one, second man volunteers. And then we've got two hits going back in the other direction. So these guys, these are here and here. So we'll remove these two. And in a battlefield situation, I would get, I would go in and remove the S's, but I, we're not going to continue beyond here, so I'm not going to bother deleting the S's here. Um, that will remove these two. So now, the Austrians are aware, okay, they've still got better skirmishes, but the French have a lot more skirmishes in that line from their two ranks. So, do, do what do they want to do in this situation? And in this situation, I feel they will close. They will order a close. The French are now happy because they've got the two lines of battle. They've got and they can keep resisting like this. But the Austrians will choose to advance, and the weight of the line advancing will force skirmishers back. Because skirmishers can't stand against line of battle in volley. Or at least they won't. And so there's one round of combat at this point where the, the French, the Austrians have committed to an advance. There's one round of combat remaining between the skirmishers before the lines vanish. And in this case, because there are still infantry, still skirmishers screening the advance, the skirmishers don't, the French skirmishers don't get unhindered fire into the attacking force. Uh, so there is one more block of skirmishers on each side that gets removed. And that is, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, Prussia, it's from the top two. So your fires removes the top line here, which is the veterans. And this removes the one of the bottom formations here. So it removes the third one. So we'll remove those two. And then the, the other skirmishers would just disappear back into their home formation. Now, that's so, not exactly a double unless you, ca are you counting all marks on the dice? Yep. All marks. I'm counting all marks. So a explode a hit, which is normally a manpower hit, but in skirmishing only counts as disrupt. We're only counting everything as disruption. So that's a disrupt hit. That's a disrupt hit. In this situation, I would count this. Hang on. So you count the. Uh, I would count the advantage that. hit as a as a okay. Uh, if there is a. You can use your hit. numpad to set the dice state. Okay, great. If there is another hit, I'll count that. But mm -hmm. if we... Um, oh. If we, if it's this, this doesn't count. This, unless, unless there's a situation where one side has an overwhelming advantage, like there are skirmishes in, let's say the skirmishes in the Sabre fortified homestead, in that case, stars won't impact an attack against there because they're firing from behind cover. Okay, so there's still some discretion that needs to be applied then when a Hollow star comes up because that's the advantage hit. Yep. Okay. Yes, you can, um, like in a tree or trees or some sort of cover, a distinct yeah. situation here. Um, normally double star won't apply, but mm. you can have cover from the stars and make it harder to remove your skirmishes. Yeah. So to be but clear, case, yeah, to be clear for anybody who's watching, the the hollow star is an advantage hit, and it only counts if one side has an advantage over the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, in this case, the, sk the skirmishes, the Austrian skirmishes are dwindling, but, and they made the correct call to push at that point because the remaining skirmishes were enough to screen them, getting into line of battle range, actually engaging volley fire. They. One of the mechanics I want to address here is that usually both formations, neither formation, tried to close to bayonet. Some of our more aggressive commanders, notwithstanding, except once when the enemy was disordered or, or, or prepared, if you will. You prepare the enemy before you charge them, because if you charge a, or a unit in good order, they had a very good chance of breaking your charge and breaking your own order and then hammering you with disciplined fire. So in this situation, the Austrians are not going to just charge in recklessly. The French are perfectly happy to not be 
to not be in a single line of battle because they may have less people shooting, but it also means that if the units break, they can fall back behind through these gaps in the line. They can fall back behind their other units and reorder to the rear. So, for the purpose of the umpiring, we will see, we will check what what the strength everyone is. What, and so we will go. Okay, there's one white dice and two yellow dice firing from this side against this one veteran and three regular dice from this side and also intensity dice on each side to see the intensity of the conflict, to see how, how heavy or accurate it dangerous is the fire. In this case, it's high intensity on both sides. We would measure this. So we're using, under Classic Brigade, the experience level of the various units, which I'm using the mor middle morale number for here, was a damage track. All damage applied, but the longer your damage track, the more, if you were a veteran, you had a three level length damage track. So the first disorder would reduce you from um, effective status three to effective status two. Second disorder would reduce you to effective status one. Third disorder would disrupt you and you'd break. And you could recover that status in a number of ways. If you were only militia, you only had a one length damage track, so any disorder would break you. Instead of doing that, your damage track is the same length in every case. Just that if you are of higher experience, it takes more intensity in the conflict to break you. So if this was if this was a one, which is not, then the incoming damage would it would only apply to units with one with one experience or lower if such a thing existed. And yes, that can be modified by circumstance. But as a default, it would apply to only that one. So if they were hit against that unit at intensity one, it would count. But against these two, they would just shrug it off and keep fighting. But that's not the case here. We've got a rotation value of six. So this side has done no effective damage. This side has dealt a, a hit and a disruption. So towards this end of the line. So there's a manpower hit, which shrinks. And I love these new parts of Damon's pieces. It shrinks them. And also, both sides have... The order has broken. Now, I'm treating a broken formation doesn't mean the unit is breaking and running. It just means it is the order is broken. So it can still fight. It can't attack. It can still shoot. Actually, I didn't adequately. So let me get the, those. I didn't fire properly before I did that. So everyone fires. Everyone expends one of their ammo load. And these two broke. So the order is broken. And in this case, it just flipped backwards and randomly put that in. But we'll fix that. It's uh, heartening for me to see you fumble with the pieces because I do that too, and I thought it was only me. No, no. <laughs> oh, you saw, saw when I was on the Brandy map earlier, I was just going around dredging up units that just speared into the board. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> Uh, so here we go. Um, yep, so it looks... And also, so this happened. The Austrian side has definitely done better. They've taken no disruption and no damage. The French side has taken d damage and disruption. So the line that is engaged gives ground. In this case, they give ground. They fall back behind the other line. That doesn't mean the whole brigade has to has to disengage, but it does mean it just means they break contact. Unless both sides are perfectly balanced, the sides do not simply stand there belting each other at point blank range. If they do stand there in point blank range, which happened on a few occasions for a while, then neither commander has a great deal of choice. I mean, they can try and disengage, but they can't maneuver side to side because they're locked in combat in volley range and they're just stuck there firing until either they pull back and try and disengage, or they manage to break through the line, or they charge and see what happens. But in this case, they don't have to do that. Well, they don't have a choice. The French front line has given way. Now, in terms of what their orders are here, there are... We could go a number paths from here, and I'm not going to track out all the different combinations. Um, the Austrians could keep pushing forward. You could ask, why, is it, why aren't the French in a single line? Why is it 
risky to be in a line like this. Let's say one of the things the French can do here and the Austrians can't, we've got two styles of troops recovering from being at broken status. And there is a third status. They could even be shattered, which means they're running until they find somewhere safe and probably off the map unless they find a very good location or they're rallied by a commander or something like that. Um, but if they're broken, they have a chance of rallying each round. If they're behind, if there's an enemy formation, sorry, a friendly formation between them and the enemy, a friendly formation in some sort of order, like a broken sh counts, but if there's two shattered units running away, no, that doesn't count. And but, so in this case, they would have a chance of rallying every turn, a reasonable chance, um, less than even. But if they were completely out of sight of the enemy at a point, either with other troops or with a commander or with supply wagons or something, then they would have a better than even chance of rallying each turn. Um, and yeah, and so that way they can rally back to more order and come, coming into the fight if they wish. So there's a chance of running here without breaking cohesion with the unit, but and that's why this unit, this brigade is in two lines. Not because they think three blocks is going to beat four blocks, but just because they can do that. Whereas if this line, this breaks, it can't just swing left or right. It's, it can't attack until it's reordered. And until this brigade reorganizes into a two by two or something like that, it doesn't have anyone to rally behind. It's just, it's, so this formation is less resilient and has less ability to keep going. The other thing you'll notice is that it's firing more every turn. So here every unit has a base three fire units. Every infantry unit anyway has a base three fire units. So we've used one. So let's say we fight this line has used one, this line hasn't used anything. Let's say we have have another battle. This line wins again, they push and they win again. So the, this now has one base fire unit each. These have two each. So you could quite easily get in a situation where this unit can't fight back. And if this unit is attacked and can't shoot back, it's just going to give way. How do you address that? With supply. So every division commander and corps commander will have a number of supply wagons with them. And I treat supply wagons as expendable tokens. So while they have useful supply, they are on the map. And they might start off as called Supply Wagon or something like that. They usually will have a name saying who they belong to. And then at some stage during the game, like if this attack is going in, the commander could well go, okay, this, these units are going to need more bullets. We want to continue the attack. Like you can even start sending supply forward before they commit. And then let's say they fired off another round of comp, another round of um, smoke. Another round of bullets, they attack, they've pushed back that second line. More fumbling to entertain Marshall. Um, we're all, for the sake of our sanity, this could hold six shot. It could hold four canister. It could hold eight bullets. I'm not fumbling around in sometimes 22 wagons to see which one is which. So they're all shroding a supply wagon. They could hold any of these until they're committed as one or another. Um, and the numbers could also vary. This is just the default. So in this case, they're sent forward to resupply in bullets. Um, I've just got it. Uh, so just got an invitation. Okay, so they, they were sent up. And now... Now, they can't load and supply while they're advancing, but, but this formation pauses. We decide it's arrived, it's going to... Spin around. If it's not being attacked, it can do it in a line of battle. Uh, if it's not being attacked, otherwise you'd have to do it in. You could resupply the rear line and then the front line. You could the rear line and then this line moves forward and then you could resupply the line behind it. But for the sake of this, we're saying they're not being pressed, and so they come up here. They resupply one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They offload eight bullets, which also defines that they were a bullet wagon. So we, the rest of the zeros out as soon as it's what ports are used. So these all increase by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the wagon is empty. And we just delete it because it's one more piece of the board we don't need. The wagons are dispersing and heading towards the rear. They're no longer a military asset. 
which means that some formations you'll see have more more wagons than others. It is a critical military asset for to be able to stay in combat and to be able to keep fighting. Having supply up at the point of combat is a critical military asset because it allows you to keep pushing. Having a brigade in front of another brigade works as well. The brigade is pushing forward. When it hits disruption, it stops. Going back to that scenario I showed you earlier, the sorry, not this one. Going back to here, the end state of the brandy station scenario. There were two big battles. What happened a lot of the time all along this line was that one side or the other would push, run low on run short on ammunition, and then have to give way because they didn't have the ammunition to keep pushing. They had, they pulled back to regroup. They pulled back to reammo. And you'll notice there are a lot more supply wagons on this map than you might see in others. And the, one of the only places where that wasn't the case was General Hood set up a big attack across Mount Dumpling here with layers. He had two, two, he had four brigades, two brigades up, two brigades behind, each of them two ranks deep. So which meant he could just keep hammering. He could drive east across these hills, through these woods, and just keep hammering east. The only reason that attack, and the umpires at the time were, or the observers at the time were agreeing with me, it was a beautiful attack. The only reason that it didn't hammer through the entire Federal Army was because it ran into a, a, a equally large concentration on the other side, just through sheer chance that the Federals had a huge number of troops in these woods. Now, that's an attack done well. One of the other challenges, though, is supply takes space. All these supply wagons get in the way. So if you have a lot of supply, you don't really want it right up at the battle line where one bad cavalry charge could open. You want to keep that under the control of your senior officers, be they corps commanders, be they division commanders. You want to keep it behind their line and then run it forward as needed. But there is that balance there of trying to make sure that you do run it forward when it's needed. Otherwise, your attacks will bog down without ammunition and maybe fall prey to an enemy counterattack. Um, that's the main th points I want to cover from an assistant umpire and from a new system point of view. Uh, briefings is more of a... I'll touch briefly on briefings because I've there is an art to them and it's one that I'm still working on doing better at. But I think I'll call out briefly to Felix, who has set up an a, a excellent, simple but excellent dispatch bot, which will make it easier to track comms. In classic, in a classic traditional situation, we won't see that. We will see, um, we'll just see people write the dispatch into their orders channel, and that's fine. We can catch them, make sure we take them to where they need to be. But he set up a a bot that allows you to sit hand one player to handle all the dispatches and just to keep track of how fast things are going and where they need to be and it's a good bot and I'm gonna use it in today's open Saturday. Uh touching briefly on briefings before I'm done. Very briefly because it's already five minutes to go. Um John actually had a good template for this because I was running some of my briefings past him and he's I think he's right. So a good briefing or what I'm trying to do in my good briefings now will include the time, the weather, either in the text of it or presented, because the weather can be important. Like if it's very hot, if it's snowy, if the ground is wet, if there's mist in certain areas of the battlefield, if it's raining, if there's cloud if there's rain expected, because you can see clouds on the horizon, that could have an impact because do you want to push the attack now? Before the ground gets wet, do you want to do a bombardment now? Before while the shots are still ricochet off the ground, or they might plow into the mud. Just looking at Waterloo as an example. So the operational context, because often that indicates that in Kriegspiel you very rarely have a this is your clear victory point objective. Very rarely. Often, sometimes you're given objectives that are purely there to help draw you and the enemy army together from the umpire point of view, like um, an army is moving, you're, you are moving from Fey to, ca to Cavalry Kuvri, sorry um, you believe they're enemy in your area the other person is told, you are in Coin Sosail, you are moving north to Orgny you believe they're enemy in your area so the two armies will collide somewhere around here and then they will fight and then as soon as they meet, the objectives go out the window 
but operational context is important. So if this player at Ogni knows they, whatever the force on this battlefield, their friends are outnumbered, they know they have to keep their troops alive, they know they have to keep them... It's more important to stay alive and in being than it is to just beat on the enemy when they see them. Your own forces, it's important to know what you have and where they are, whether or not you personally can see them. Allied forces, forces that you don't command but are in the area and how they might impact you. Nearby enemy forces, what do you know about the enemy, right or wrong? Because one of the uh, big things in Fog of War is you may not, not everything you think you know is actually true, and but you don't know enough about what you do know. Uh, mission profile, what is it that you are specifically being told to do? And commander location, where is your commander if you need to talk to them, if you need to send them couriers? So in some situations, like there's a massive Napoleonic play-by-post game going on at the moment where using that template, you as a division commander might be told where your where the player core commander is. The player core commander might be told where his army commander is. And although all these levels are players, you need the information to know, well, first, where to direct your couriers to, if you're talking to them, and secondly, what directly impacts the situation. Even though you are here, is there an attack going in that direction? Do you need to guard that flank? Where are your supplies coming from if you're going to get them? Thank you very much. That's the end of my School of the Empire section. You can just stop recording, Marshall.